One of my favorite memories of recording is, you know, I went in the studio with Brian Eno, Jerry Harrison, and David Byrne. I came in and they said, okay, we want you to just go out and wait around until you think there should be a guitar solo and then play a guitar solo. And we're going to write the song around that. So I went in and I waited, you know, listened to the song and it was a really great groovy track. And, uh, then all of a sudden, I just jumped in and played a solo. I looked in, back in the studio, and once again, they were just jumping up and down. Ah! You know, I thought, well, that must have gone pretty well. Hi, this is Adrian Blue, and you're watching On the Record with Ultimate Guitar. Yeah, so the first question I have is, how has the Remain in Light tour been thus far with Jerry Harrison? It has been absolutely great. So much fun. The audiences love it. Um, everybody's dancing. Everybody leaves happy and joke, full of joy. And that's exactly what uh, we set out to do with this. Jerry and I originally talked about this for many years. We said, you know, the, uh, the YouTube uh, Talking Heads Live in Rome 1980 was our blueprint. And we, we thought that that video got such great response, we thought it was a good thing to try to do again now. And what can fans expect from these uh, shows that are coming up compared to the ones from uh, last year? It's the same show. I mean, we haven't played enough places to, to need to, to change it. And the, the, the interesting thing about it, it's an 11-piece band, and we show up and we do the show. We don't even rehearse or anything. And every time, it's just perfect. <laughs> So we've just done, I just, uh, just got back yesterday from doing four shows throughout California, and each one of them was absolutely wonderful and great, so I think everybody's really happy doing this. The hard part, of course, is an 11-piece band is difficult to travel and book and so forth, but we do what we can, what we can with it. And what are some memories of, of recording and also touring behind the album originally back in 1980 and also 81? One of my favorite memories of recording is, you know, I went in the studio with Brian Eno, Jerry Harrison, and David Byrne. Chris and Tina had come and gone. Their parts were already done. There was nothing really much to play to, just bass and drums and maybe an occasional da -da 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 or something, you know, all in one key. And uh, so I tried out my pedals, and I could see in the uh, studio room, they're all jumping up and down, listening to all the sounds, and they... I came in and they said, okay, we want you to just go out and wait around until you think there should be a guitar solo and then play a guitar solo. And we're going to write the song around that. <laughs> there was no vocals or any signposts of any sort. So I went in and I waited, you know, listened to the song and it was a really great groovy track. And uh, then all of a sudden I just jumped in and played a solo. I looked in, back in the studio and once again, they were just jumping up and down. Yeah. You know, I thought, well, that must have gone pretty well. So I waited around another two minutes or so and played a second one. And that was the song Great Curve. It was like, uh, it was like watching something explode. Up to that point, Talking Heads were doing really well. And in my touring with uh, other things I was doing, you know, I could see, you know, you could hear them in every little crevice. You know, you walk into a bookstore, they're playing Talking Heads. But I think when we went out with the 11-piece band, 10-piece band, actually, when we did it then, um, it, it seemed that I watched them kind of, boom, become huge. And I was standing beside that and watching that happen. It was a lot of fun. And have any former Talking Heads members seen this band live? And if so, what were their thoughts? Chris and Tina came to see us in Connecticut, where they live, and they loved the show. And I remember... Tina said to my bass player, who's in the band, Julie Slick, she said, it's yours now. You've taken it over. You you go with this. So they gave us total approval. Before that even happened, when this was still kind of in its earliest stages, uh, Jerry talked to David Byrne, and David Byrne thanked him and said, thank you. Tell Adrian I said this, you know, thank you for doing this, because he doesn't want to do it, but he's happy that we're doing it. And I will say from my seat, in, as in being in both both situations, that I think we do a really good job of it. We make it, uh, the spirit of it is right, and no one's trying to be David Bowie. We have, I mean, David Byrne. We have 
you know, three or four different of us singing, but we just do it our own way and just try to do the music and the songs justice. And they're great songs and they come off perfect. And which Talking Heads songs are the most fun for you to play live and do some songs prove more challenging uh, than others? Uh, yeah, there are certain ones that, that are more challenging. Um, I love playing The Great Curve, of course. I've always loved doing uh, Psycho Killer. It was the first song I think I ever played with The Talking Heads. And now I'm singing it, so it makes it extra special, too. Um, we do a song called Drugs from that's not from Remain in Light. It's from uh, Fear of Music. And I really enjoy the guitar things, and I also sing that one, and I like to make the sounds and stuff. There's, it's a very curious song with a really interesting mood to it. I'm singing Take Me to the River. Uh, that's interesting. It's not normally my kind of vocal, but I feel like I'm doing doing it well. And, uh, you know, there's so many others. I mean, it, you, there's a lot of spots for, for guitar playing, as there was originally on the record and on the original tour. So I'm really having a great time playing guitar to this music. I, I've told Jerry before, I think it was more comfortable for me playing with Talking Heads than maybe just about any other thing I did. It just feels so at home with it. For one thing, as I said, the songs are all in one key. So if you're a guitar player, you just, you know, you just, anything you play should, should feel great because you're not, you know, changing keys or switching chords. You're not looking at arrangements. You're just, okay, here it is. Now it's time for me to play. Okay. Another time, let's see, what is the song that I think it's a Houses in Motion. I really enjoy uh, the soloing I get to do at the end. It wraps up the song. But it's not just about me. I love the, the band itself. The singing is excellent. The rhythms, you know, so many. Everyone's a great player and everyone's totally focused. There's no drama. That's, that's what makes it a fun band to be in. And what is your guitar setup for the tour? It's the simplest setup I've had in a while. I took out all the MIDI stuff and returned to playing the Strat. Uh, I play the Strat basically through an Axe FX, uh, which in, it allows me not to even use amps. Uh, it goes direct into the board, and then they feed it to me through the monitors, and I wear some in-ears. Um, it has a MIDI controller just to move the programs the way you want them. And it has two uh, pedals beside that. One is the volume pedal. One is an expression pedal. And then I play always through a compressor that's always on. And the last final thing, there's one other pedal on the floor. It is called a Harmony Man. And with that, I can do some fun things with guitar. Otherwise, everything is done through the Axe Effects. And those are all sounds and programs I've designed since I've had it for 10 years now. And as far as the Strat, is that a new Strat or is that an old Strat that you play? It's a brand new Strat that the that Ron Thorne at the custom shop at Fender made for me, made me two of them. And they're they're beautiful. They have uh, a, this, this, what makes them a little bit custom other than you choose the, the neck and the pickups and things like that, is that they have uh, a sustainer on the uh, neck pickup so I can do a lot of sustained things. And they have a terrific new tremolo that's been made in Spain called uh, the Vega trim. And they have locking tuning keys and interesting good colors. And out of all the artists you've worked with and bands you've played with, do you agree that the Bears may be the most underrated one? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The Bears certainly um, deserved better. And it's strictly the business side. The band was giving the goods, very much so. And we were a great band and we loved each other. We're childhood friends. And so we were very, very much in tune. And I think we wrote a lot of really good, straightforward kind of pop songs. Everyone in the band wrote, everyone in the band sang. And our shows, we just blew the roofs off the places we played. So, uh, but... You know, if you don't have the support of the industry itself and uh, if something doesn't click in a few years' time, you, you stop because you just can't keep doing it forever. 
And uh, sadly, that's the way it went with the Bears. But they're, you know, I, I still have so many people talk to me about the Bears and they love those records, which are kind of hard to get. We went on to make five records total, one of them a live record and four records of all new material. And what was uh, Zappa like to work with? He was the consummate um, band leader. I mean, he told you exactly the way he wanted things to be. He didn't leave a lot of room for you to create. That wasn't the idea. The idea was to play his music consistently and correctly and to be a professional touring musician. No, no messing around. You know, I mean, you were supposed to be there. You were supposed to never do drugs or ever be drunk or anything, you know, crazy like that. So you could do the job right. Uh, I learned so much from Frank in that one year because I ended up having to go home with him every weekend for three months while we rehearsed so he could show me the upcoming parts because I was the only one in the band who was not a reader. Everyone else would read the parts from and score on Monday. Uh, so I got to know him really well, and, and he, he taught, taught me a lot of things, many of them non-musical things, most importantly how to be a recording artist, how to tour, how to have your own business, how to uh, mix a record, how to master a record, how to make a movie. <laughs> so much information to my uh, green little ears at the time. And uh, I don't know how I would have done the things that I did after that if I hadn't had all of that instruction and encouragement from Frank. So I owe him a whole lot and I love him. Because I know in the past you've talked a lot about what the audition was like with Frank, but did you have to audition for also Bowie as well? No, I didn't. Uh, my audition for, for David Bowie was that he was standing on the side of the stage watching me play with Frank Zappa. <laughs> and, and he said, yes, that's the guy I want. So that was an easier audition. Yeah, Frank's auditions are notoriously difficult. The music is difficult. And I knew that I hadn't done well with the first audition because there was too much chaos. People were moving pianos and drum kits around, and there I was standing in the middle of the room with a microphone and a little pig nose amp on the floor, not very conducive to doing something well. So I waited around. I had to wait around all day anyway because then they were going to fly me back to take me back to the airport and fly me home. So at the end of the day, there was kind of a moment where he was just standing there. Finally, everything had quieted down. And I said, Frank, I'm really sorry. I don't think I did well, but I, I, I thought it would be different. And he said, how so? And I said, I thought it would just be you and me, and I'd show you that I can do this. So he said, okay, great. Let's go upstairs. We went upstairs, sat on his his purple couch. I put the pig nose down between the pillows and, and turned it as loud as I could <laughs> And did the audition again. And about the third of the way through, he stopped me and shook shook my hand and said, "You you got the audition." And he, uh, you know, he was very gracious. Told me all the things to expect. You know what you get paid for different things. And he even uh, called my girlfriend at the time and said, "This guy is really special." And uh, it was just thrilling. You know, he treated me graciously, and always was that way to me. So I feel like he, he saw something, and um, he told me later he auditioned 50 guitar players. And something I don't think I've ever heard you talk about was, was there a, was there a reason why you wound up not touring with Nine Inch Nails back yeah. in 2013? Yeah, I don't mind talking about it now, but at the time it was so upsetting to me, I felt like it was better to say nothing. Um, here's my version of it now you might ask someone else that and they might say something different but when trent called me he was very uh, he was very excited about the idea that he and i would reinvent nine inch nails and he even told me don't worry about learning the songs verbatim just get to know them so i listened to the songs and i really didn't try to figure parts out i did a little bit just out of curiosity so when I got there, we had 12 weeks of rehearsal time. I thought, that's the amount of time I have with Frank Zappa. I could learn anything in 12 weeks. But after 17 days, he said that some of the guys in the band weren't comfortable with me. They didn't feel like I was doing my parts right and that I knew the songs as good as I should. And I said, listen, I can tell you for sure 
this is 17 days in. I, there's no way. I'm still working out ideas of sounds and things. I'm not even worried about the songs. But uh, those were L.A. kind of players, you know. Um, and in my mind, they they have very little imagination. I'll put it that way. So he said, it's time for you to go. He was very upset about it himself. He said, you, you're my favorite player in the world, but if my guys in the band don't want you in the band, and then, you know, there's nothing I can do. And so, you know, it was terrible, really. I had put everything on hold for the next year and a half, everything. Canceled all my gigs, came home and didn't do anything for six months. I couldn't even get myself mentally and emotionally to go in the studio that's in my very own house and try to work on anything. Just just lost all everything. Three months after that happened, uh, Robert Fripp decided I should no longer be in King Crimson. So that was the extra nail in the coffin. And after about six months, as I said, I said, well, the, the good thing is now I'm Adrian Ballou. I'm going to do Adrian Ballou now. Boom. And from that point on, I, I just I wrote something called Flux. I invented something called Flux. I, I wrote an orchestral piece, played it with an orchestra. I did a movie with uh, Pixar that won an Oscar. So it worked out for me, too. Because you just mentioned Crimson. Did you ever get a chance to see the uh, version of King Crimson from 2013? I, I absolutely did not want to see it. I didn't. I sort of lost my feel for the whole thing i love the people in it but i just felt like there's no reason for me to hear it now i'm not involved and that is i think by now 14 or 15 years ago i still love all the people involved and i love the music that we made previous but i don't know that band's music uh i also have not seen the film they made uh because it was mainly really about that band and i don't know anything about that band but of course, my friends Tony and Pat were in the band. Is of course Robert as well. So, I um, I respect it. I respect what they did. And how how demanding is Robert as a band leader? He can be demanding for certain things, but to to be honest with me, he gave me complete leeway because right from the beginning he said, you know, if you're going to write the melodies and the words and sing the songs, you need to tell me what do you need. So when we work on songs together quietly or pieces together, it would be sort of at some point my decision to make, can I turn this into a song or no? Should it continue on as an instrumental piece? If it was going to continue as an instrumental piece, Robert, that was Robert's department. My department was, well, I think I can make a song from this, write the melody, write the, the lyrics. And, and uh, so then if it needed chord changes, which... Eventually, it always did. I would dictate those things, and Robert was very happy to have me do all of that. Uh, so I think it was much harder on on Bill Bruford, who he had, had already been in a band with, and they had a little bit of a a time of it, but not really. I mean, you know, people think it's worse. It's it was never uncivilized in any way. That's not the way those people we all play together. Tony Levin, the bassist. Uh, like to leave the room a lot <laughs> and let us sort it out. But there was never any any real problems that, you know, when I look back at it, I just hear all the great music and the wonderful shows. And, you know, I love those guys. So I'm happy um, that we had all that 33 years together. That's a lot of work. Were you surprised to be mentioned in the Guardians of the Galaxy film? I was absolutely blown away by that. I... It's the last thing in the world I expected. I love those movies from the beginning. I'm a big fan. Um, and so when someone called me and said, hey, you got to go see the Guardians of the Galaxy, and I went, I, I just didn't know what to think. I still am kind of shocked by it. But I found out through someone that knows the director that it was his decision. He's a fan. He uh, was in the 90s in a band in college that played uh, some of my music, solo stuff and King Crimson stuff. And so it comes from him. And that that's, makes it even better for me. It wasn't written in there as some sort of 
oddball thing. It's it's really what he thought. So I just want to say thanks, Adrian, for taking the time for doing the interview today for Ultimate Guitar. Well, it's great to see you and great to talk to you again, always. Anytime you want to do anything, let me know because I've got so many things still going on. I'm, I'm far from done. <laughs> okay.